Can you help? Can you help? Yeah, me? I hear you. Thank you. Cheers. You know, I mean, what do you guys think of this service already so far? <laughs> amazing, amazing. You know, I mean, it really, you know, it's incredible just to have an international service, sing songs in different languages. I mean, I am so super enriched already. You know, and, and I hope that you also are really encouraged wherever you might be or whatever situation going on in your life that you are really, really encouraged. You know, just before, about uh, three weeks ago, my wife and I, were, we went away to Dubai. Mm -hmm. And I, I got to say this to you, I don't know if any of you follow me and my wife on our Facebook page. You must have seen so much stuff going on there on the Facebook page. Yeah. We created an amazing memories that, you know, I, thought, I, I, I was planning to show a couple of pictures to you guys today. But, you know, the pictures came in late. But don't worry, there's always time Amen. for everything. Am I correct? Yes. Exactly. So, so don't worry about it. That, it was my wedding anniversary. 30 years been married to that beautiful woman. You know, and, and honestly, I am praying to God that like, give me about 40 more years or 60 more so I can really, really love this woman. You know, she's the best thing that's happened to me as well that God has brought into my life as well. And I've got so much to share with you. But please, turn your Bibles to Luke 24. Luke 24. Um, please, can you, can you share this, this scripture? Yeah. You know, Luke 24, uh, the next yeah, that, that perfect pattern. You know, the, in, in Luke 24, 36 to 47. Oh, interestingly, you know, I've read this scripture times without number. Yeah. But it actually brought something in me that I haven't really, a part of me that I have not actually touched in so many, so many years since it happened. So really, get ready, you get to know me a bit more today. Am I correct? Mm. You know, in Luke uh, 24, I read, he says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened, and though they saw, uh, 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 they saw a spirit, and he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? See my hand and my feet. That is, that is high myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have a flesh, neither does it have a bone. As you see that I have. And when he has said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieve for joy, you know, and when marvel, he said to them, have you anything to, here to eat? We're going to have some food afterwards as well. <laughs> they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke, that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and prophet and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their mind to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Manchester. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> Beginning from Manchester, from Jerusalem. You know, just to put to context here, this is following the crucifixion of Jesus, and, and he has actually risen. You know, they were just talking, with, they didn't tell us what they were talking about, but really, you can guess what, you know, what, what, what they might be talking about. I think, I feel, maybe the loss, the relationship they already fostered within the three years with Jesus, and now they just felt emptiness, you know. Uh, loss can actually trigger a lot of things when you lose someone, you know. And uh, really, I don't know where you are, what's going on with you as well. But really, I want to share about my own self as well. Because in 1992, 10th of August, I had a gas explosion that actually I could have been split into pieces. You know, um, 
I am here talking to you, but what really happened is a part of me, being an African, in Africa, you cannot say that you are depressed. In Africa, you tell somebody you are depressed, they're just going to look at you, what's wrong with you? Put yourself together. The, the, basically, absolutely, they can't tell you, you can't say that. You know, we are still doing a lot of work around that area to actually get people to connect with their emotions. I, I raised up being not connected with my emotion because if I do, then I'm not strong any longer. I, I am the weak and if I'm not careful, I'm useless. And hence, even I can relate to some of the things to the Lord they actually shared. You know, it creates sense, it, it, it creates kind of a false sense that if you're not very careful, you present the wrong way. When people most of you, the way you know me, when you ask, I ask you, what do you think of Mr. Baller? You say he's a bold guy, he's confident, you know, he, he reaches out to people, he's very friendly. But I have so much vulnerability that I've been hidden away. But they are all been unlocked thanks to Jesus. Yeah. I don't know what your vulnerabilities are, but God is trying to unlock them today. Please do not bottle it up. Don't be an African today. <laughs> Whatever it is, don't be an African in your emotion. You know, what am I sharing this with you? Even my children, to the point that even my children, they hardly see me cry. You know, but I'm learning. Thanks to Jesus. That it's okay to cry. It's okay to connect with my emotions. It's okay to connect with how I really feel about something. Actually, guys, I'm sharing this with you today. I was so scared and I thought I was going to die. I was only 22 years old at that time. Just Tolu is actually older than me at that time. He's 24. I had promising things ahead of me. Things I wanted to be, you know. I was going to church, but it never changes me. I was the same person that I, that I was uh, because even after my um, com confirmation, the very day of my confirmation, I was already looking at one of the girls in the confirmation so we can confirm each other again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm putting all this out there, you know. When Jesus opens your mind, yeah. it changes you. Yeah. I don't know about you today. I got things happening in your life right now that God is using to touch you, to call you. Just like me, I was at the point of my deathbed when I was lucky to make it and also somebody reached out and started the Bible with me. Yeah. And that is the beginning of the difference you see today. The confidence you see today is beginning, that is where it comes from. The gratitude that I'm filled with, that is where it comes from. And that gratitude led to so many things. Thanks to London Church, we planted the church in Lagos. Mm. And I know some of you will understand that. Lagos Church was planted in 1989, and I was met in 1992. Mm. Now, that actually changes my life. In 1992, when I got baptized, so all the October uh, baptisms, I'm really excited about this October baptism because mm. my wife and I were baptized in October. <laughs> She was baptized on the 24th of October, and I was baptized on the 28th of October. Mm. And we're going to be 32 years in a disciple. You know, why am I sharing all this with you? Because of the gratitude and the changes that God made, I left my job and went to the ministry in 1995. And that same year, within three months, we were sent. Please, can you share this, the, the fifth slide? Within. Three, within three, three months, we were sent on a mission team. And guess what happened? We went on a mission team to this place called Worry. And I want to give, share about this guy, who is in the, as you read it, in this information, you will see Dr. Emmanuel Urobo. I want to share about him because he's a mentor, he's a friend, and he's a partner in Christ Jesus. You know, and I want, he's late now, but his legacy lives on. Mm. The decision of one man. I'm going to tell you what I, he has actually created. You know, it's amazing. 
The decision of one man, this man, Dr. Manuel Robo, came to England in 1991. A lawyer came to study, and through that process, the, the Boston Church planted London Church, and then the London Church met this guy and studied the Bible with him in the process. And then they, in 1992, he went back to Nigeria. And then he, this guy traveled all the way from, the best way you can understand is Manchester to Aberdeen. Now think about that journey, Manchester to Aberdeen. This guy was living in Aberdeen and the closest church to him is in Manchester. And guess what happened? He, every month, twice in a, in, a, in, a, in a week, in a month, they travel down to Lagos to worship. Now that is commitment. Now not only that, this same guy as well, in the process, baptized his wife and then baptized his neighbor and then we had about five disciples already in worry by, the, by 1995. Hence, because they were still coming and showing commitment, the Lagos Church felt the need to send out a team. Mm. And guess who went there? My wife and I. You know? And all I want to say to you is that the decision that you might be making today, I don't know about what's been going on, but what really happened is this, repentance for the forgiveness of sin is not a joke. And the last slide, please. In the last slide here is, you can see stages of change. Pre-contemplation. Maybe you're at that point that you're just not sure. All these guys, why are they so crazy? <laughs> why are we so crazy? And you don't understand why. You might be in that pre-contemplation stage. And then you felt, you know what, even though they're crazy anyway, I'll come to church with them. Mm. So you're joining the crazy guys now. <laughs> Coming to church, that's you contemplating. But you're not sure yet, is it for me or not? But the next stage there, in, in that stage is, what's the next stage? Help me with that. Okay. Okay. That was what happened with Anik. She got to that point of determination and felt, you know what, I'm not letting me go. I mean, I need fellowship with me in fellowship like, uh, last Sunday. And she said to me, I'm getting my time to this week. That is decision. Yeah. You know, when you start to get to that decision point, this is the effect. But that decision point will not come unless you start studying the Bible. I'm going to leave you thinking about it. But guess what happened? At every step of that stage, the Lord Jesus want to walk side by side with you. Mm. Just the same way he was walking with them. And he told them, peace be unto you. Amen. I call up my brother. Raymond, please. Let's go, Raymond. Yeah. <laughs> We're with you. Let's go, Raymond. All right. Okay. Alright, okay. <clears throat> I'm going to start with a quote from an English writer and see if anyone can guess the writer's name and the novel's title. Okay? Shall we start now? Okay. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. War is peace. That's it. Anyone can guess? Wendy. George Orwell. Yes, I was titled to. <laughs> yes, awesome. Wendy, yeah. you get an extra red packet in the. Remind me. Yes, of course. This is from a novel, 1984 by George Orwell. This book was published in uh, 1949 as a focus of the impending communist wave. Orwell's quote is incredibly accurate in summarizing the ideology of communist regimes. It is my privilege to share some thoughts from the Bible of this international service. As uh, Mr. Bola from Africa, uh, spoke before me. So I consider myself 
rep to represent Asia. <laughs> okay, my name is uh, Raymond Wong, and I was born and raised in, in Hong Kong. Okay. Uh, in 1990, I became a Christian. The same year, many significant things happened in the world. To name a few, uh, the Berlin War had fallen. Communist countries in Eastern Europe mostly collapsed. The Soviet Union dissolved. As a result, mainland China remained the largest communist country in the world. Um, as a young Christian, as me, I was so inspired by the commission of Jesus to make disciples of all nations. I felt an urge to share the gospel with the Chinese people. Knowing that China, China was and still is an officially atheist country. That same year, the Hong Kong church began recruiting disciples to form a mission team to evangelize China. I seriously considered joining the team but I wasn't 100% sure if I should go. It was regarded as very unusual for a person from a free capitalist world to live in a tightly controlled con a communist country. There were, of course, many reasons supporting me in going, especially after reading about uh, 10-year cultural revolution that happened in China, where teachers and scholars were targeted, humiliated, or even killed. Countless historical books and cultural sites were destroyed as symbols of the old ways. Children were encouraged to denounce their parents if they were seen as betraying the party. Still, I was waiting for the last throw that would break the camel's back. And it happened that, and it happened like this. In 1993, I was traveling on a business trip to mainland China. After eating a lunchbox on the train, I found no bin to trash. I asked an attendant where I should bin the lunchbox, and she sneered at me without saying a word, grabbed my lunchbox, opened the window beside me, and threw it outside the train. I was astonished with my, own, my, with my mouth open. I don't know how to react but could only think of a scripture from the Bible of Jonah 4, 11, which says, Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? <coughs> there was a sound pounding in my ear. Should I not have concern for the country of China, in where there are more than 1.4 billion people who cannot tell a lunch boss should be dressed in a bin. Mm. <laughs> there was the last straw on my back. Yeah. Three months later, I found myself with my wife Gloria relocated to the biggest city in southern China. <laughs> to keep the mission team safe, it was, and still is, it was not wise to openly invite people to church as we do in a free country. Instead, we met with people individually, ensuring they were not secret police and were genuinely interested in learning about the Bible. We often met people at a place inside a university called English Corner. 
where individuals were eager to practice English and were open to new ideas. Many would adopt English would adopt English name like uh, John, Alex, Richard, and this. <coughs> I still see it as a special encouragement from God, even in something as seemingly small as the names of the first two men we baptized. The first man, the first man had an ordinary English first name and a common Chinese last name. But when we put them together, it became extraordinary. In Chinese custom, we in Chinese custom the last name came first. Strange, strange enough, right? The last name came first. So he always introduced himself as my name is B. Bruce B. <laughs> <laughs> the second man didn't need both names to make an impression. His last name alone was enough. His full name was Chester Kong. It may not sound extraordinary at first. But when I tell you he is a direct descendant of Confucius, it may give you pause to show him respect because of his last name. Perhaps you are wondering what is the point of mentioning this name? A name, just a name, it's not a big deal. It's not, it's no big deal. And yes, that's true, it's not a big deal. But to me, it was a little encouragement from God. Mm. It felt like God was whispering, I have given you the most well-known Chinese man in modern world, <laughs> and the most well-known man in Chinese history. Mm. One simple, one muscle, what more could you ask for? Mm. Be bold and make disciples in China. Even though you don't see me, I'm right here behind the scene. With this small encouragement, we took a big step of faith. Starting with 12 disciples as a small mission team, the church grew to 200 disciples within five years before we left China. Praise the Lord. By the way, both Lee and Con became the first two local evangelists very soon after they were converted. They planted many small churches and brought numerous people to Christ throughout mainland China. <coughs> Four years ago, my wife and I embarked on another journey. This time, wearing of this tightly controlled Eastern world, we came to the birthplace of the modern free capitalist Western world, the UK. <laughs> <laughs> we settled in Manchester and now live in Bolton. Mm. On our first visit to Bolton, I noticed a road sign for Wigan Pier, written a brown background which usually indicates a tourist site. Mm. I guess correctly, it was a place referenced in George Orwell's book, The Road to Pier, The, the Road to Wigan Pier. Mm. Living somewhere connected to Orwell, his famous quote, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength, war is peace, often lingers in my mind. At first, I couldn't find any direct connection between this quote and living in the UK. However, recently I read a news report about a school where a student was allowed to identify as a, as a wolf. <laughs> I found this as astonishing as the time I couldn't find a bin to trash my lunchbox. 
There is a saying in Chinese, "Ama hai no yang," which means something like as obvious as a mother is a woman. However, it feels so confusing that living in the UK, you can't always tell whether a mother is a woman, a mother is a man, or even a mother is a wolf. I pray for the Lord to give me the wisdom and courage to tell people that ignorance is not strength. God answered my prayer by sending me a small gift. Two names, once again. A few years ago, my my wife and I visited an old family friend in Glasgow, whom we call Uncle. His daughter noticed I was particularly interested in some old Chinese book on his bookshelf. After the uncle passed away, his daughter asked if I would like to inherit her father's book. I gladly accepted and went to Glasgow to collect them. Just two weeks ago, mm. <coughs> when I got home, I flipped it through the books, and to my surprise, a handmade greeting card, I, a handmade greeting card, fell out. Mm. I recognized it as the card we sent to the uncle thirty years ago, though it had long faded away from my memory. It served both as a Christmas card and an and, 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 and announcement of the birth of our first daughter, Joyce, who was born in December just before Christmas. Mm. Can you slow the slide? Okay. Uh, I have placed a photo of her inside the card. So this is very cute. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and on the outside, it's outside. I played really tight to it. <laughs> Joys to the world. <laughs> a twist on the song, Joy to the world. Amen. Apparently. Again, a card is only a card. It's no big deal. But to me, it was a small encouragement from God. It might be not only of joys to the world, but also of Jesus to the world. Yeah. In the flesh, yeah. with the story of Bruce Lee and Chester Hoon, I felt, I felt as if God was working behind the scenes. But this time, as both the Bible and the card revealed, Jesus is in front of the scene guiding me, guiding my way directly. Mm -hmm. With this card, it felt as if Jesus whispered in my ear, therefore, go and make disciples of all England, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always mm -hmm. to the very end of the way, of the age. May God bless his words. Amen. Go, Pat. Wow, how did I follow that, really? Um, apart from that, God hopefully will speak through me. Um, so, I'm an Irish Brit. How's that possible? Well, I'm born in Ireland, pretty good Friday agreement, so therefore that makes me Irish. And I have my dual nationality. So, I'm representing officially England. And Europe. So, wow. so it's, it's, and I am in national dress. And you're going to go, what? And I'm going to go, yes, because you live in my country. Yeah. We all live in our country, I should say. And this is how we dress then today, so it's a national dress. I know it's not quite as fancy or beautiful as some of the amazing outfits I've seen today, which I absolutely adore. Mm. So, can I have the next slide? So you see, lots of people, and the title of my part of this is The Gospel is Really for All Nations. 
And I want us to understand that Raymond just summarised it. I'm going to read the same scripture, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. I don't have the slides for it, but you can follow along if you've got uh, access. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The gospel really is for all of mankind. And you know, it's very easy, isn't it, to look at the differences and the diversity of the world. So again, we can just look around the room and see loads of different clothes, loads of different faces, different shades of skin colour. It's incredible. It's amazing, the diversity. Think about our country and differences between, say, Scotland and Wales and England. But then you go further afield. We've got deserts, we've got... Our forest, we've got rainforest, we've got you know tropi tropics, ice, ice, places full of ice and so on. And we all can also think, sadly, that this diversity can cause awful problems. And we think of the Middle East right now. And we think of all over the place, there's so many wars, but the ones that come to mind are obviously Russia, Ukraine, and the Middle East. And there's trouble in Asia, there's trouble in Africa, in South America, in America, in our country, it's all over. But I don't want to talk about that, I want to talk about what we have in common. So, let me ask you a question, or a question or two, or rather, let me get you to contemplate it. Do you need food? Do you need water? I do. Do I need shelter to survive? Do you need shelter to survive? Interesting one, this. Do you need air to survive? Because I know I do. If I was to come up and cut you, not that I would, would you bleed? Yeah. Do you get anxious? Do you get worried? Just because I'm a Brit, does that make it unique to me? Are you telling me somebody in France? Or somebody in China, somebody in Nigeria, somebody in Argentina isn't going to get anxious. How did we get here? Some incredible woman gave birth to us. Yeah, yeah. What happens? We all die. Do we need love? We all need love. So this is why the gospel is for all nations. And I've been incredibly unfortunate in my life, and that I've travelled the world. And I've seen Christianity throughout the world. My father was a senior diplomat, and that basically worked for the Foreign Office, and he got to travel around the world. So when I was in the early 70s, about three, four, I lived in Zambia, in Africa. So I can relate to the African culture. It's East Africa, I appreciate it's not West Africa. <laughs> Do you know what my first memory, and one of my earliest memories, is being in the cathedral in Lusaka, leading up to Christmas. And it was this massive in my head, because I was only small. I was carrying a, a figure for the nativity, and lots of the children in the community went on. And I remember walking up the aisle to where they had the nativity scene and placing my figure on the scene. And that's an incredible memory to think. It's probably, well, it's probably over 50 years ago, and I still <laughs> Then a little bit older, six, seven, my parents moved to Saudi Arabia. Mm. And I lived in uh, Jeddah and visited and toured around the country. Obviously, Islam. Christianity was against the law back in those days. Um, however, as a diplomat, you could, have a, could still have your faith as long as you kept it to the embassy. So we had this sort of area where it was known as the British Embassy, and on a Sunday, the community would get together in the hall, and uh, we'd have our Sunday school, and we'd worship, and we'd you know, spend time uh, within that country. Again, an incredible memory. 
When I was about 10, we moved to Malawi, which is also in uh, East Africa. And that was uh, amazing. I'm a bit older, so my memories are far more clear. And I remember being able to sing the Curia Nasal in Chamber. Um, I'm not going to try and sing it for you. It goes from Amway Amway and Chipondu and Move to Chitengu to Chitere. I don't know if I'm going to go from my Malawian friends, but I just remember that. And I remember one time over an Easter break, we went down to a place called Salima, which is near Lake Malawi. And on the Sunday, my parents and my two sisters and myself wanted to worship God. So we rocked up at this little church. Mm. And uh, it's the early 80s. It was so poor and impoverished. However, when we turned up, the only white people, the community was incredible. Every single person wanted to greet us. Um, they didn't have pews in the church, it was a space, they had some rush mats and so my mum and my two sisters got a mat to sit on. Because I was a boy and didn't. And we worshipped for about three hours celebrating Jesus' resurrection. And at the end of the service, everybody wanted to shake a hand and thank us for coming to their service. And I was just more grateful that they would welcome me so much. We all need love. Then I moved to Bermuda, which is uh, again an incredible experience. This tiny island, 20 miles long by one mile wide. Um, a very religious community, and again, going to church there was incredible. Uh, I went with my mum and dad, and uh, we got welcomed, and uh, I just remember the singing. And maybe that's what's helped my joy and love for worshipping God in song. And then my dad's final posting was the British Virgin Islands, which is in the Caribbean. And again, I just remember the Christmas celebrations in church and just the community. So what's my point? My point is unity. It doesn't matter your background. But I've seen it firsthand, what the love of Christ does. It conquers all diversity. It separates that unnecessary vexation that we can feel. But also, why is that commonality? Well, Alex kindly shared Romans 6, 23. But I'm going to share Romans 3, 23, because here's the crux. He shared about the fact that we need God's grace. But just to remind you, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not one of us in here that's perfect. Yeah. Not one of us. And that's why we need Jesus. Yep. Yep. And that's why we can be so unified. It's because it doesn't matter where we're from. Just like we need air to breathe, we need Jesus and his love to be forgiven. In John 12, 47 to 50, Jesus spoke and he said, If anyone hears my words, but does not keep them. I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Yeah. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. How cool is that? <laughs> Jesus isn't our judge, he's our saviour. But he's told us what we need to know to get saved. So for us who are disciples, and Tolly, thank you so much for your humble, open heart. And I, like you, I'm a prodigal. So those who know me, I got baptised originally in 1991. But then I left the church for quite a while. And two years ago, God worked in my life. God gave me an opportunity to realise that sin is not the place to live in. My life was being damaged and destroyed. 
and I've got the opportunity to come back and find God again. And it's a battle. I am not perfect. But it's that knowledge that I am loved. And God uses his people to show that love. So for us who are Christians today, I just want to remind you, if you're struggling, it's okay. If you're finding it hard, it's okay. And I'm going to use Tolo as an example. Did any one of us think badly of her? No. no. Oh my goodness, my admiration, my respect, the courage it took. But you know what? Tolo will tell you, as I felt, the incredible love of this community, mm. of our church. And where does that stem from? It stems from God. For those of you who are visiting today, who aren't maybe following Jesus' teachings, speak to the person for you. Why? Because they will show you the commands of Jesus so that you can have what we have. It's not a secret to be kept hidden. We celebrate what God has given us. So those who are visiting, take time to look at that Bible. Don't leave it on the shelf. Take time to explore it, to ask those questions that you have. Take time to find out what this gift is. Amen.